none of you have said, I just want to put on the table, which is that for all the successes and the good stories, including Nepal today, you know, we haven't finished. And uh, the reason I wasn't here the other day was because I was in Dubai with the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Councils with Andrew Steer. And the council I'm on is dealing with the post-2015 MDGs. And it is tremendously tempting to charge off on new topics, including climate change and the environment and the sustainable development goals, and forget that there is still an important poverty reduction agenda. And in a way, this conference has had two halves. It's had the, what do we do about traditional aid uh, for human development, and it's had the new agenda, but we shouldn't rush into the new one and forget the old one. Now, we're gonna spend the last 20 minutes on the question, what do we do about all this? And let me, as I did last time, hear some answers. We've had 40 at least bullets from you for your trip reports on what we've learned. What do we do, Andrew? Being an obedient uh, ODI uh, staffer, um, I tried to actually answer your question in the terms that it was stated. I, I have, I think, 140 characters, but um, I'm a non-adopter of Twitter, uh, and I heard privately, that please don't spread it around, that Dan Kress is a late adopter of <laughs> Twitter, so he might be able to check this and possibly use it. It might also be a haiku, but I'm not quite clear about it. It's in two sentences. Act on the principle that there are multiple valid motives for development help. I use help, I'm sorry about that, that it's quicker than cooperation. <laughs> um, embrace this complexity and leverage these forces to grow the public space. <laughs> you, you'd have to hire ODI to figure out what that means. It's a call for diversity and complexity and <laughs> multiple <laughs> actors. Anybody wants to follow me on Twitter? I'm aiming Justin Bieber has a million. <laughs> and I, I still only have 700. So anybody wants to join, do, can do that. Uh, who else would like to say something? What do we do is the question. Uh, not that I can't answer that. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I say something anyway. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what we should do. Um, I just, thought, just, just, just two quick comments. I have to reply to, <laughs> to your very amusing <laughs> comments. But I mean, on, on policy, I mean, I, think I, I really appreciate that Dan raising this and, and, uh, and others. Recently, I mean, it does strike me that the most important thing that's happened on policy, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't see there's a problem about policy dialogue. I mean, the emerging countries have transformed the policy environment within which uh, the poorest countries now operate. In other words, the, 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 the hegemony of neoliberalism is broken for good. And that's basically because um, it hasn't worked and because other countries are coming up. And so, so I'm, I, 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 think it's, I think it's really good to, 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 to emphasize that. I'd be worried about... Uh, kind of to tr trying to re refine ways to to kind of share policy, or in fact, you know, my my response to Dan, I suppose, is that actually in the 80s, especially, aid was very much used to change policy. It was very much the idea of of, of adjustment to use small amounts of money to transform economies, and and, uh, and so, so I think we I think we have been there before. And so while I agree that policy is the most important thing, my worry is that powerful donors impose policy. And, and get it wrong. And then that links very much to my last point, which is I, I really, really do defend the public sector. And, and I, re I realize it's unrealistic. The UN was unrealistic in the 40s. A lot of things are unrealistic. We have to fight for them. Because the, o the other option is, basically, and I, I, I utterly respect Bill Gates and Soros and other people, but you know, Romney didn't make it uh, as president of the United States. Why? Because ba basically people didn't think he was on their side. And I'm not up for a world in which the big development money comes from a few mega rich people. I think we need a huge public sector involved there as well. <laughs> the ODI people, by the way. <laughs> I, I think that one works better. That works. It's oh, it does work. So I, I was taken by, um, by, two, by two comments. Firstly, uh, we had a comment earlier about wh where is the voice of the, of the average low-income country, and that's um, not necessarily ODI's fault. We did have about four or five other low-income country, very impressive low-income country people due to come, but due to various visa and flight issues, I won't go into that last one, um, they didn't quite, quite make it here. But I think, I think there is a, a sense that I have that um, and also hearing Mary Ann Addo's um, uh, uh, description of, the th of them, th of, of Ghana facing the same old problems with the donors, knocking on the door every 10 minutes, 
um, them being in a position to generate more of their own resources, but still spending the same time talking to donors because the donors are constantly demanding their time. And I think that says to me that the agenda around the traditional aid-dependent low-income country that where aid is still providing a third, a quarter of resource in um, of public spending in those countries, we, we're in danger in the insatiable appetite that we have in the development community of redeveloping our paradigms every five to ten years. And yes, that is we need to evolve and we need to change our ideas. But if we we are in danger, I feel, um, and having come from the NGOs where we've been fighting ahead of Busan for for the aid effectiveness agenda to be to stay on the table, there is a danger that you know even five years after Paris, when those issues are so relevant, we will leave them behind. And um, I'm I'm really a strong call that we sort of keep those on the agenda as well as evolving the agenda. Very good. Thank anybody not ODI want <laughs> to say anything? <laughs> okay, Paolo. <laughs> we're going to ODI. In, in two minutes, we're coming back to yes, the panel. Yes, uh, so but I'm going to take a couple of... Just hang on a second. Just I, I want to, just bef after you've spoken, just and after Lenny, just ask David whether he can be drawn on... Uh, on the golden thread, but you might not want to do that. So I'll just give you advance warning. Paolo. So I'm going to follow up on a couple of things that, that Johnny said and sort of extend them further and throw in a provocation. Uh, um, so my tweet following up on the first thing that Johnny said is neoliberalism is dead, long live neocolonialism. Because, I mean, it seems to me that much of what is happening in terms of new actors, China, Brazil, and, and, and everything else that, that's happening in Africa, op yeah, it might be a great open up of policy space, but at the same time, we need to be careful about some of the, uh, the, the downsides. And it, so to me, the action point is let's do some work on uh, making sure that, or not, not, not making sure, but sort of trying to put the issue on the table that new donors and new practices might actually be uh, actually old stuff, re history repeating itself. The second point is about the global public sector idea. And this is, I, I've already said this in an email to, to, to Jonathan, but to me, the key starting point on that one is really about uh, delinking aid from uh, uh, the, the coming from taxa national ta domestic taxation in, in donor countries. If we want to go for a global public sector, then let's be very um, uh, ambitious and let's you know finance it through global taxation sources. So whatever, you know, carbon uh, the airline levies, whatever you name it. But let's just sort of delink it from the national budget processes. Thanks so much, Paolo. Lenny. Thank you. My um, proposal is a bit more superficial, I'm afraid, but it just seems to me that we need to get much better, all of us, at how we are communicating and telling this story. I mean, the sorts of things that I've heard over the last couple of days, we've talked about global public goods, we've talked about this kind of multidimensional kind of plurality of actors and spaces. I really like the idea of posses of problem solvers. It sounds very different to the kind of narrative we're often locked into about donors, recipients, aid. So how can we actually very practically, all of us, change the conversation? Interestingly, research that we've done recently looking at public opinion here in the UK and public attitudes tells us that the public is actually quite fed up with this simplistic story of aid and us giving money to poor countries. They want something else from us. They want a more complex picture, a more complex narrative. And I think we've got the beginnings here, so can we make progress on it? To David, would you like to be drawn or would you rather not? Yeah, I'll get to it. Uh, in a couple, two or three minutes max. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, let me start with my back to office report. I mean, I, I think what I would say to myself is, or to anybody else who is listening, how, how interesting to have participated in another Cape conference where my principal takeaway is here's a group of public financial management experts. Uh, who are talking for two days, supposedly about public financial management, but actually most of the most of the most interesting things that come out are about the non-financial aspects of development, the the institutional aspects of development, and from this one in particular, I mean, one of the big things that comes out is that uh, financial constraints on development are far less important than they were when the aid business uh, uh, started, and yet we haven't quite recognised that yet. So institutions are the thing that matters. Um, when Jonathan was uh, speaking this morning, it seemed to me that his uh, um, observations about aid dependence and about the important the value of uh, development cooperation in, in, in mix was absolutely pregnant with, the c with something that he didn't actually say, which is that 
you get that pattern because the principal obstacles to development are institutional and too much aid in very poor countries messes up the institutions. Uh, whereas in middle income countries, including I, 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 I'm not just uh, Colombia, but I suspect also um, Brazil and certainly India, there are remaining institutional problems which an outside agency of some kind can actually help with, particularly if it doesn't have very much money to spend. Um, institutions are central. I mean, uh, uh, um, Simon wants me to talk about something which actually requires another whole conference, I'm afraid, which is if institutions are important, what exactly are the institutions that poor countries need to get them to the next stage? And it was said just now that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the rise of, of emerging, uh, emerging economies ha has uh, um, put a lid on the debate about, uh, about neoliberalism as, 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 a, as, a, as a policy prescription. It ought to have also put the lid on the idea that what poor countries need is uh, the governance institutions that have emerged in Europe and North America uh, in the last uh, um, half, half century. It ought to um, have persuaded everybody that uh, the kinds of governance arrangements that are necessary are first of all very diverse. Everything from Vietnam and China uh, to uh, Brazil, and it certainly doesn't involve what our current Prime Minister in this country calls the golden thread, that's to say a set of institutions which are precisely where Europe has arrived at the end of a long period of uh, rather slow uh, 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 evolution. But that really is another conference. Yeah, no, uh, it probably is, but I wanted to make sure we had the topic. I'm going to go along the panel. I know I've been mean to you because I've cut your time, but I want to know what we should do next, either you or somebody else. Very specifically, we've got 12 minutes for six of you, so two minutes each, starting up there, please. Okay, just three quick things. One, the non-traditional donors are very much welcome and whereas they provide additional support, additional assistance, it would help if they were to come up with clear guidelines as to what they expect or how they would channel the kind of support, the kind of cooperation to the developing uh, or res aid recipient countries. Two, I think also in the same terms, the traditional aid donors should very quickly get into terms with the coming on stage of the BRICS so that we don't continuously face the question of what do you think about Chinese aid and all that kind of thing. The third one is <laughs> that it's a big joke classify South Sudan as a nick. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, I think probably I would say uh, most of all, I, the, the, if we need to talk much more about how do we make uh, institutions and governments transparent and accountable to their own citizens. I'm going to keep coming back to this point. It just seems to me so central and something I haven't heard enough about, I think. Uh, um, when we talk about the importance of country ownership of aid, it was always assumed this is about the government <coughs> being in the driving seat. I think sometimes that's problematic unless the government is accountable, unless there's serious efforts to deepen the accountability of government to its own people. And that that's where the emphasis of aid money ought to be going, more than demanding an accountability to the donors based on results that the donors themselves are going to judge. That's not the way to go. The way to build a strong, effective uh, uh, system will be to have results that are tracked by national citizens of the country concerned. So much more attention needs to be paid to how you're going to build the capacity of national citizens to hold their governments to account, how you're going to uh, ensure that there's proper parliamentary oversight, parliamentary committees, and a complexity to the dem democratic practices nationally, not just uh, 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 multi-party elections. Um, I think linked to that, we just need to make sure that we're always looking at applying power analysis 
to every aspect of development cooperation um, uh, and, and including to our own practices. Uh, and that's why I can't actually end without saying that I hope that I in future all takeaway final panel sessions don't have seven men lined up yeah. and no <laughs> women. Yes, I know. But some of the men are wearing bikinis, though, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I just wanted to say, I don't want us to lose the point you made in the first round about the importance of funding NGOs in developing countries and having partnerships and twinning and so on. And, um, I mean, my sense is that DFID spends rather less on that than some other big donors, like the Dutch and the Canadians, for example. Yeah, I think DFID is not doing bad, but it, it's not right in the forefront of that. And I think there's a very big difference between... Uh, supporting individual NGOs for delivery of a project which you've designed yourself to strategic support in a harmonized way for the civil society sector. And that's a very different game altogether. It's like play, uh, trying to apply the Paris and Accra principles to civil society and working in a harmonized way to build the sector rather than running projects through the sector. And that, that's where we need to get to. Thank you. Oh, no, I, I have, I, I, do, I, do I get double time if I have two minutes? No, 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 not even with a bikini. Okay. Uh, uh, three things. One, uh, sticking to the optimistic tone uh, and, and remembering a sort of uh, Nick's point about poverty. Let's focus on the fact that for the first time in human history, it's actually possible to deal with extreme poverty as a global, f it's actually possible. It is within reach uh, over the next 20 to 30 years to eradicate mass absolute poverty as defined in the, uh, as currently defined globally. And, and I, I think, and we, we can actually manage to combine that with broadening the agenda. And we need to do that because part of the cost of dealing with poverty, of course, is that we poses greater, we pose greater change uh, challenges to the climate to the climate and to the planetary boundary so we we actually in order to do that we we need to to make sure that the growth that we are that we need in order to reduce poverty is greener than the growth that we've that we've had in the past and then secondly and and sort of removing my uh, DAC hat for a moment and taking on my OECD hat is that is about about knowledge sharing and contrary to common perception actually there are some emerging countries uh, within the OECD too including Mexico and <coughs> Chile and uh, Turkey they are all members of and perhaps in the future world and uh, policies are important old ways of transferring knowledge uh, are not particularly good conditionality doesn't work there isn't one model but there's still a need to learn there's still a need to gain experience there's still a need to exchange experience OECD has a an interesting phenomenon. It's, it's got, and I, I think firm, I firmly do believe that the best way of learning about policies is exchange between practitioners, <coughs> sort of that practitioners meet and exchange experience. Uh, OECD has got a network of fifty thousand policymakers, fifty thousand policymakers in all awkward areas. Most of them form from OECD countries, but an increasing number <coughs> from other countries. Uh, and, and I think there are, there are some, that's probably one of the largest knowledge, pol sort of policy-based knowledge networks in the world. Th there are others, other <coughs> knowledge networks. One of the things we need to do <coughs> is to see, can we bring these, no can we make better use of these knowledge networks for, uh, for, uh, for development? One more point. Um, then my third point was, let's try and make the global partnership an arena where we can exchange experience about s between different partners uh, where we can challenge is each other openly about the, the type of issues that we are dealing where we can have a truly multi-stakeholder alliance where we can build alliances of the willing on different in in different areas and move it forward and then my, my, my half point, and that's cheating, I know that, but that's because you, you gave me the bikini, so I, I, that <laughs> earned, me the, earned me the right to the half, and that is sort of let's avoid, there is a risk in the whole discussion about sort of some of your, let's not go, go back to the future. When I started development cooperation, we delivered tide aid turnkey infrastructure projects. Norway delivered tide aid uh, turnkey infrastructure projects. 
we stopped doing that some time ago for some reasons. So, so, so let's not, uh, in all our eagerness, let's not forget that we've been there, done that, we've learned some lessons. Let's not go back. Let's no, not go back to the future. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'd like you to say in your reply the following words, if you agree with them: Donors, please don't walk away from budget support. <laughs> <laughs> Donors, please do not walk away from budget support. <laughs> 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 that's, my, that's my quote. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be, um, I suppose, put this in the form of a message to um, developing countries, and in particular developing countries in Africa. And I say this in the presence of countries that provide development assistance um, and, and also those that, um, that undertake policy work. What is going to be important going forward in terms of a set of reforms um, and, and, and what I think are going to be very high up on the reform agenda of many developing countries is one, the strengthening of ethical behavior and I think it's going to be about establishing those institutions that are necessary to hold governments accountable, um, whether it is the institutions of parliament or the institutions that parliaments established, human rights commissions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second is going to be reforms that take on a much more pragmatic approach. And this is going to be a lot about homegrown solutions, about identifying what works when and how um, and I think it's going to be important that partners understand <coughs> this and that partners <coughs> align the work that they're undertaking, the policies that they're designing with these homegrown solutions that governments are going to tackle. The third is technical skills. Um, and in particular in fragile, in, in fragile states, um, but also in middle income countries, um, that there has to be a much stronger focus on what the capacity needs are um, and how technology and skills are transferred. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Mr. Daniel. Um, yeah, three, three quick points. Um, I think uh, one, w I think we need to put the PE back in CAPE, um, the public mm -hmm. expenditure and not mm -hmm. focus on aid. And I think we need to add another P for policy. Um, to Jonathan's point, and um, uh, actually some of the things, I don't think we can go back to conditionality. That's not what I was talking about. I think it's a lot of the things we're doing now is supporting South-South cooperation and around policy exchange, a lot of experimentation. Those are the kind of approaches that I think that, that, that can yield uh, impact and what John talked about as well. Um, I think we really need to embrace this notion of aid as leverage. Um, uh, I think we need to start doing to, to going back to tracking the money and linking it to outputs because – and we need to – you know, understand this is not from a donor recipient perspective. This is actually what the Ministry of Finance wants to do in most countries. That's where my experience with when I was prior to the foundation working at the World Bank, no one was more of a of a an advocate for getting value for money than the, my Ministry of Finance call counterparts. I mean, they were the ones who were saying, oh, how do we get some value out of this health sector? We're spending a lot of money. We're not sure we're getting a lot of value. So I, I don't think there's a divergence between donor and, and, and government here. I think this is actually, very, in my experience, very much what they want help figuring out how ways to produce better value and improve outcomes in, in, in the countries they're working. I think the, the last, I will say, is a little bit more <coughs> granular and detailed is is I think we really need as a donor community and as, as, a, as a community, donor, developing <coughs> country, civil society, is focus on some of these federal, state, local issues, which I think are really vexing. Um, because that's where uh, I spent a lot of time working in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, looking at budget issues in northern Nigeria and not terribly easy places to work. Um, and in, in some of the, uh, the states in north, uh, northeastern India, and. Um, there are really big issues around uh, challenges associated with uh, with the lack of fiscal federalism, <laughs> largely. And I think there's not a th – that's a solution space that is just – we don't have good solutions. And there's no one really focusing much attention on it, yet so much of the poverty is concentrated in those, those, those places. We need to do a lot more in that area. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. I've got one ask. I'd like you today to go home, have a bath, Make yourself a warm, milky drink. Put your feet up. 
and watch the most important film ever made about the future of development cooperation. I'm talking, of course, about Casablanca. <laughs> and there you will find the three messages. The first of which is, we'll always have Paris. But as Rick and Ilsa knew, that was a thing about a past golden moment that has moved on. It's they must find new things in their life, not go back to Paris. The second thing is, you will never succeed if you only round up the usual suspects. And the third one is, if you are flexible and open to, ch open to change, this could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> Brilliant. The, uh, one of the best books the about development is Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, and I <laughs> recommend that when you've watched the film. Um, you'll be amazed when you see the report on this meeting how coherent and uh, 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 the, the, the discussion has been in this last session. Covering both the horses, the what do we do about the remaining uh, uh, poverty and the post-2015 development goals, and how we organise aid efficiently to support countries that need it, recognizing all the diversity and complexity, the importance of institutional development and so on, and the need to begin shifting our attention at the same time to this whole new agenda uh, of which climate is by far the biggest and the need for thinking in new ways about development cooperation. And I don't think it's an impossible, these are not contradictory asks, these are actually entirely consistent with each other. But any development institute like ODI, any development ministry, uh, any international agency, any business or philanthropy that doesn't do both, is going to find itself um, thrown out of the circus, actually, because if we don't deal with this poverty problem and we don't also begin to tackle the big global issues, then I think we are actually not doing our job. So let me say thank you very much to all of you for your contributions. Join me in thanking the panel, and I'll hand over to Andy Norton. Thank you very much. Is Andy here? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, you can let me sit. Don't, have, don't go. Thanks very much, Simon. What a great last panel. Um, for those of you checking your programs, I'm not Alison Evans, and I kind of wish I was after David's comment about the gender balance of the summing up. But uh, Anyway, Alison would have loved to have been here and sends, um, well, I'm sure she would have found the day as exciting as she did yesterday and as I did uh, throughout the conference. I thought it was really great. Um, very exciting, lots of new stuff. There were times when it felt a bit more like, oh, the title's gone, a bit more like um, new puzzles and old pieces, rather than old puzzles and new pieces. But the, um, I think Simon's point that for all the celebration of success, this complexity, some of the new puzzles will be much tougher. I mean, we've talked about the success of the sort of global purpose around poverty reduction. That's a staggering contrast to what's happening with the global pur purpose around climate. And so, you know, engaging with that is a massive new challenge. I love the phrase from, I think, Nkasana Moyo about new geometries of accountability and power. And all that we've heard about changing instruments, changing directionality, changing relationships, changing purposes, and changing actors suggests that we're entering a very new world where the language will change and the discourse <laughs> will change. And I hope this conference has helped you as much as me think about that and think about the ways we go from here. Um, a quick word on the forward agenda. I think one thing we maybe didn't get to that will be important will be the challenges around data and analysis and communication both with each other and with our publics around the way, the very, very rapid way that the whole environment is changing. But in any case, I'll leave my concluding comment at that. We look forward to meeting the challenges, and we look forward to working with all of you on those challenges and following up with you. So to the really important bit, thanks to everyone, all the <laughs> participants, particularly all of the speakers. I thought it was a fantastic lineup, and let's have a round of applause <laughs> for everyone who's <laughs> contributed. And now we thank the money, traditionally, <laughs> but <laughs> many, many thanks to all the donors <laughs> who've um, supported this. No, I mean, really, um, more than just the money. The partnerships have been um, hugely important and hopefully will be in taking forward many of the discussions here. So 
again, but many thanks to those who've supported this, this process. Um, now, the biggest one is the thanks to the staff. Is Elizabeth here? I think there's something for you behind there. Right. <laughs> okay, great. <coughs> Elizabeth, I understand, has done the vast majority of the heavy lifting <laughs> in organising this campaign. And the next person I want to thank is the person who led the development of the conference, which is Romilly. Yeah. I know she did, <laughs> did the bulk of the heavy lifting <laughs> and, and did it. Yes. So it's Romilly, Gideon, Ed, Ryan, Hafsa, um, Ed, yes, no, I've said Ed once, and <laughs> all the other members of CAPE as well. Many thanks to all of you for the work you've put into this. <laughs> did I miss anyone out? <laughs> So Gideon was co-leader. <laughs> right, okay. um, finally, uh, the team say that the report will be out by the end of the year, and they've asked me to say that publicly. So your, it will your be presentations will be sent um, right. pretty soon, early next week, but turn around mm -hmm. all the presentations from that week. Yep. 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 Um, and yes, feedback forms. There are some feedback forms there, <laughs> please uh, <laughs> fill them in. <laughs> which is a fairly downbeat note to end on. But anyway, <laughs> many, many thanks to everyone. Uh, I've, in, I've hugely enjoyed it. I hope you all have as much as me. It's very challenging, very productive, and many thanks. Thank you. Thank you.